Now, we're continuing on our series entitled Demonstrations and Manifestations of the Spirit. Today is part five. And I want you to really listen up and take good notes. If you have areas of your life that you want to get better, if there's anything in your life that's out of order, how many know that by faith you can set it in order? God has given us that authority when we know how to use our faith, how to use the name of Jesus and the weapons of our warfare, that you can set in order anything that's out of order, whether it's something physically in your body or something wrong, going wrong in your marriage, no matter what it might be. I want you to know there is nothing, nothing too hard for God that he cannot fix it. Amen? Hallelujah. But now listen to me carefully. Even though we know that with God nothing shall be impossible, all things are possible with those that believe, right? Yet God does not do it all by himself without our participation. You see, the promises of God point to our potential, but they require our participation. Let me say that again. The promises of God point to your potential. The promises reveal what you can be, what you can do, what you can have, but they require our participation. See, a lot of people, they just want God to do everything, and they just sit down and do nothing. It doesn't work that way, folks. Now, I've been talking to you about the process the Lord began in me after I was born again in 1975. I would like for you to look in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. Paul says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun or began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, most folks, they get born again, and honestly, they grow very little over the next how many years they got left on this earth. If you talk to most Christians it doesn't take long before you realize they know very little about the Word of God. They know nothing about the covenant that God made with us <clears throat> through Abraham and his seed, the Lord Jesus Christ. They know very little about their inheritance, what belongs to them as a child of God. Now, I could just continue down that line, but you get <clears throat> the gist of what I'm trying to say to you. God wants you to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that's the reason he says to study, to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Listen to me, folks. God doesn't want you to ever to be ashamed of the fact that you were ignorant of something that belonged to you. And because of that ignorance, you was never able to possess it. You see, God created man in the very beginning and gave him authority and dominion in the earth. How many of you know that even though Adam and Eve sinned, God never rescinded his plan for mankind? Amen. As a matter of fact, the Lord Jesus Christ came to restore everything that Adam lost. Now, when I got born again, according to the words of the Holy Spirit written by the Apostle Paul, God began a good work in me, as same as he did in you, and the Bible says he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The Amplified Classic says, developing that good work and perfecting and bringing it to full completion in you. Everybody say it out loud. He's still working on me. I remember way back when our children were little, my wife had started the children's ministry at the church that we were attending. And she would teach those kids that song, he's still working on me. We ought to still be singing it today because he's still working on me. I don't know about you, but he's still working on me. And I want him to continue working on me. Amen? Now, listen, God hasn't given up on us. God hasn't given up on me. God hasn't given up on you. And as your pastor, I refuse to give up on you as well. I may know things in my spirit where you're not walking, you know, in victory in certain areas of your life. But you know what? I speak the word over you. And I pray for you. And I believe that the Spirit of God is working in you. By His grace, you're going to be everything that God ordained for you to be. 
Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. You know why? Because he didn't frustrate the grace of God. He yielded to that grace. He yielded to that power of God that was at work in his heart so that it could reflect in his outward life. Now, listen to this. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul writes, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has ordained that we should walk in them. Again, the Amplified Classic says, Born anew, that we may do those good works, which God predestined, planned beforehand for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life. Everybody say living the good life. How many of you believe that God wants you to live the good life? I remember several years ago, I did a series called Living the Good Life. Now, I want to live the good life that God planned for me to live, which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. God prearranged it. If you would go to Psalm 139 sometime and look at it, you will find that David talks about a book that was written, and in that book, all the days of your life were jotted down in that book, listen to me, before any of those days ever was, before you was ever born. God planned that life. How many times have we lived a day that we did not fulfill what God had planned for us? Do you understand why it's so important to know the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ? and to be led by the Holy Spirit because he will lead you into that life that God prearranged from the foundation of the world. God never intended for your life to be filled with tragedy and with drama. But so many times people make wrong choices because they're not listening to the Lord. They're not being led by the Holy Spirit. They're not doing what the Word of God says to do. Rather, they're doing what they want instead. But as I pointed out to you many, many times, the way of the Lord is perfect. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is dead, right? Now, according to the Word of God, when you were born again, the Bible tells us now you're able to do those good works that God predestined for you. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, right? If anybody's in Christ, he's a new person, a new man, a new woman. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, what I really want y'all to understand is this, that when you're born again, at that point, the possibility exists to make everything new in your life. I mean, you might have been on the edge of divorce. You could have been on the edge of bankruptcy. You could be dying of some physical sickness in your body. You can be tormented in your mind. But I'm telling you, if at that point of being born again, because whether you realize it or not, being born again is not just joining the church. It's not just getting baptized or sprinkled. It's a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ where at the moment that you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and you confess him as your Lord and Savior, he imparts eternal life into your very spirit. The heart of man is the spirit of man, the inward man, the hidden man of the heart, the Bible calls him. Not only are your sins forgiven and you're washed in the blood of Jesus, but at that moment, at that very point in time that you are saved, that you're born again, you receive the very life of God himself. Hallelujah. Now, y'all have heard me say this, but I got to keep saying some of these things because we got new people constantly coming and people are watching online that's never heard it and don't know this. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. People hear that and they say, that means we're going to live forever. Well, if living forever, listen to me, if that's all eternal life meant was living forever, then the lost sinner has it too. And we know that he doesn't. For John says, he that hath the Son has life. He that hath not the Son of God does not have life. This eternal life is more about the quality or just as much about the quality as it is the longevity. You have been given the very life of God. The life of God is imparted to your spirit. 
And when you fight the good fight of faith and lay hold of eternal life, the Jesus himself said, I want you to have life and to have it more abundantly to the full till it overflows. And when it overflows, that means it's going to touch other parts of your life other than your heart, other than your spirit. It's going to touch your body. It's going to touch your mind. It's going to touch your family life if you allow it to. But you've got to yield to the Spirit of God. You've got to cooperate with the Spirit of God to allow Him to have His way. Hallelujah. Now, as I said, God planned for you to live the good life. And the good work that He began in you is the new birth. Are you born again? Do you know that you know that you know that you are born again? Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. That means to be born from above. Hallelujah. Your spirit man is born again. The real you is changed by the power of God. And he said, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But once you're born again, now you can see, you can perceive, you can understand the things of the kingdom. And God doesn't want you to be ignorant of spiritual things. He doesn't want you to be ignorant of the working of the Spirit in, the, in your heart, in your life. And how God brings about the success that you desire, that you want in every part of life. Now, look at this. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. God placed in you his very own life. Now, that life has the potential to make everything better. I'm talking about your family, mental, physical health, finances, peace, joy. Now, let me ask you a question. How is that life that God placed in you when he began that good work, how is it brought to completion? I want you to look at something. Go with me, please, to Philippians 2, verse 12, 12 and 13. And I want to point out certain words so that it will really stick with you. Wherefore, my beloved, you have always obeyed, not as in my pre presence only, but now much more in my absence. Notice this. Work out your own salvation. Everybody say it out loud. Work out your own salvation. <laughs> Next verse. For it's God who works in you. Say it out loud. I'm going to work out my salvation, for it is God who works in me. The good work. Now, we're still, in, look here. We're still in the same book. We're still in the same letter. When Paul said, I'm confident of everything, that the good work that he began in you, God will bring it to completion. How is he going to bring it to completion? He's going to help you. He's going to teach you. He's going to lead you to work out your salvation. Now, salvation is more than just being born again. If you study the two words that are used in the New Testament, one is sozo, S-O-Z-O. The other one is soteria, S-O-T-E-R-I-A. And both of them refer to being saved, delivered, protected, preserved. In other words, it's everything that you will ever need. It covers all the bases, right? And so he says, now, I want you to work out what I put in you. What I did in you, now you've got to work it out so that it will affect your marriage and your children and your mind and your body and your finances and every part of your life. God wants your life to be exceptional. He wants you to stand out like a light in the darkness. Amen? When he says, work out your own salvation, the Amplified Classic says, cultivate, carry out to the goal, fully complete your own salvation. Look at 1 Peter 2, verse 2, as newborn babes. Now, I realize that there's a lot of people even though they have been saved for several years, they are still spiritual babies. You say, how do you know that? Because Paul said, you're carnal. You're not able to take the meat. You're still on milk. 
at the time when you ought to be teachers yourself, you still have need of the milk. See, there's a lot of people that have been saved a long time, but they're still on the milk. Wouldn't it be strange if you saw somebody with a, uh, had a baby and 10 years later they're still drinking the, the mother's milk or still on the bottle? Huh? That'd be kind of weird, wouldn't it? Well, I think it's weird when I see Christians who've been saved for 20 years talking about God put cancer on them, teach them a lesson. I'm like, you don't even want the milk. You own stuff that's gone bad. You're drinking the Kool-Aid, what you're doing. And that Kool-Aid's not good. Amen? Now listen to this. A newborn babe, desire the sincere miracle of the Word that you may what? How many want to grow? How many want to grow spiritually? What about do you want to experience growth in every area of your life where things are getting better and better and better? Now listen. Amplified Classic says, and grow unto completed salvation. And I, I keep pointing this out to you because I want you to understand that God wants to complete what he began. He wasn't interested just in getting you born again, and that's it. If that was the case, you'd got saved and immediately died and went to heaven. No, that was the starting point for everything in your life to come into line with God's Word and God's will. That's the reason you should pray, Lord, remove everything in me, everything in my life that's contrary to your Word and to your will. I don't want it in my life. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Now, God cares about your family. He cares about your financial needs. So how now is that completion going to happen? How is God going to continue the work that he began in you? Look at James 1, verse 21. The last part of that verse in James 1, 21, the last part says, Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your what? So, now listen to me carefully. Those of you who have done some studying, the word soul in the original Greek is suke. What does that sound like? What is it related to in our English? Psyche. Suke. Psyche. And what does psyche refer to? The mind. It doesn't refer to the heart. James is talking to people. If you go back and read the beginning of this letter, he calls them brethren. These are people that are already born again. They are already saved. But their they're thinking is messed up. She is a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. As one translation says, so does he become. That's the reason it's so important to get your mind renewed with the Word of God. James says, now listen, you're saved, you're born again, but now you've got to do something about that mind. So receive with meekness, humbleness, teachableness, the engrafted Word. Allow the Word of God to be engrafted into the Word that you had and let it override, overcome, and overpower the Word that you had from your elders, the tradition that was passed down to you of religion and family or anything or anyone else that taught you something rather than the Word of God. Let that Word, the Word of God, take first place in your life. Engraft it. Hallelujah. I'm telling y'all, when I got born again, and I started reading the Bible, I discovered almost everything I had been told growing up. Almost everything I had been told about God, about God's Word, was not true. It was nothing but tradition. Now, I, I mentioned this last week in one of the services today. I want to go over to Matthew 15, and I want to read something to you about tradition from the Amplified Classic. See, the people came to Jesus, and they said, you are breaking our traditions. Jesus said, by keeping your traditions, you're breaking the commandments of God. And he said to them something that's just so powerful. 
Give me a moment. I'm going to get over there in just a minute. A lot of us have things that are handed down to us. Now, listen to this in verse 6, the Amplified Classic. So, for the sake of your tradition, the rules handed down by your forefathers, you have set aside the Word of God, depriving it of force and authority and making it of no effect. Tradition deprives the Word of God of having any effect in our lives. If you hold to tradition rather than receiving the Word of God, let it engraft into your mind. Go now over to 1 Peter chapter 1. Let me show you something else that you've been redeemed from. Now, you all, you all know, if you've been listening very long, you know that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, right? So that the blessing of Abraham would come upon us. But listen to what Peter says in chapter 1, 1 Peter 1, in verse 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things of silver and gold from your vain conversation, which means your empty way of life, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. We've been redeemed from the tradition handed down by our fathers. The Amplified Classic says, ransomed from the useless, fruitless way of living, living inherited by tradition from your forefathers. That's the reason you've got to ask yourself, is my mind renewed with the Word of God? How am I ever going to live the life that God wants me to live if I have thoughts other than his thoughts. Remember he said to the prophet Isaiah, he said, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. He did not say that they were not attainable because the apostle Paul himself said, I have the mind of Christ. Well, folks, you know, if you know anything about Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul, right? then you know that his way of thinking and his tradition was so contrary to the way of the Lord, right? That it took the Lord Jesus Christ coming to him, talking to him, teaching him, so that his mind could be renewed to thinking properly, the way God wanted him to think. And he finally had come to that point where he could say, I have the mind of Christ. I have an anointed mind. Why? Because my mind is filled with God's thoughts, with God's Word. It's so important. I do wish that every one of you would take about a week to keep pen and tablet with you. If nothing else, have your phone, the notes on your phone available. And every time that the Holy Spirit checks you on something that you said or a thought that you had, and you realize at that moment, that's not God. That is not the way of God. That's not God's thoughts. That's not God's word. So where do these thoughts come from? Well, one time, Judas Iscariot, the Bible says that Satan entered into his thoughts, gave him that thought. That's when he betrayed Jesus. So often thoughts come to our minds that are not of God. That's the reason the Bible says you've got to cast them down. And you've got to arrest those thoughts. And you don't give place to those thoughts. You don't give voice to those thoughts. You allow them to die unborn because you realize, that's not something I want in my life. I want what God wants for me. Amen? So I'm going to receive and beat the engrafted word, which is able to save my soul. Now, what is the soul? Now, in case you don't know this, because if you're like my wife who grew up in a denominational church, she would tell you, they preached about and they sang about the soul of man, but never the spirit. Now, in, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about being born again, now, this was really a strange thing to Nicodemus. He said, how is that possible? Can I enter to my mother's womb a second time and be born again? And Jesus said, listen, that which is of the flesh is flesh, but that which is of the spirit is spirit.
And if you look at the King James Bible, the first word spirit, listen to me, that which is born of the Holy Spirit, it's a capital S, is spirit, little s, man spirit. He said it's man's spirit that's born of the Spirit of God. In the same way that flesh gives birth to flesh, the Holy Spirit gives birth to man's spirit. Are y'all with me now? And Paul said, and I pray, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, that God would sanctify you completely, spirit, soul, and body. Now, as I said earlier, Peter and Paul referred to the spirit of man as the hidden man of the heart or the inward man. He said the outward man perishes, this body, but the inward man is renewed day by day. Right? What I want you to understand, it was your spirit that got born again. But once you're born again, now you've got to deal with the mind. You've got to deal with the thoughts. The soul of man is his, the will, the emotions, the feelings. Why do you think that's the reason we're told to walk by faith and not by sight, not by our feelings, not by the physical senses, but to be governed rather by what we believe, not by what we see in the natural or hear in the natural or feel or the circumstances around us, but we walk by faith in God. We believe what he says. Amen? Now, here's the thing. The work began in me when I got born again. He continued to perform that as I worked with him. We're laborers together with God. Everybody say it out loud. I am... A laborer together, laborer together with God. One time I was reading the part where Jesus said, I will build my church. And as almost I could hear that still small voice with the Lord when he said, but I didn't say I'd build it by myself. Y'all understand that? He said, I will build my church. But we're laborers together with him. We're called together. The church, the ecclesia, is a called out assembly called out called out of what we're called out of darkness into his marvelous light we're called out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son that tells us that once we have been delivered out of that kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God that we have a responsibility now to pursue after the things of God why do you think God said, now, in Romans 12, 2, I'm going to put it in, in my own words. I don't want you to continue to fashion yourself after this world. That's what being conformed is all about. He said, don't be conformed to the world. Stop acting like the world. Stop talking like the world. Stop thinking like the world. Don't fashion yourself, model yourself after the world. He said, but... I got something higher for you. I got something better for you. I want you to be transformed. I want you to go over, beyond, and above anything that you've ever seen, experienced before. Because God is able to do exceeding abundantly above anything you can ask or think, the Bible says, right? He says, now here's how it's going to happen. I want you to be transformed, the Greek word metamorpho. That's where we get our English word metamorphosis. You go through a change. Like the caterpillar goes through the chain, becomes that beautiful butterfly. He no longer resembles his old life. Your life in Christ should no longer resemble your old life before you was in Christ. That's the reason I heard somebody say, I look a lot better in Christ than I do out of him. Amen? Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. He says, now, here's how it's going to happen. By the renewing of your mind. Renewing of your mind. We're talking about a complete renovation. If you was going to renovate, let's say you're going to renovate your your bedroom. You know what you would do? First of all, you take everything in there out. You take everything out. The dresser, the nightstand, the bed, everything, you take it all out because you're about to renovate. You're about to make everything brand new. And once you get it all out, now you're going to strip it. From wall to wall, from floor to ceiling, and when you go back in, you're going with everything brand new. Hallelujah. God says, that's what I want to do in your life. I want everything in your life to be brand new. Yeah, everything. 
And it starts, we get in that mind, renewed with the Word of God. Hallelujah. Listen to me, folks. A lot of Christians, they don't have faith to appropriate the promises of God. A lot of people don't even know what the promises of God are. They don't even know what belongs to them. When I say they don't have faith, why don't they have faith? Because the Bible says faith cometh by hearing, Romans 10, 17, by hearing. If you read Greek, it goes by hearing and hearing and hearing. It is a continuance, present tense verb. The verb that is used in the Greek is a continuous present tense verb. That's the reason in the King James, they said, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing. They wanted to stress that point. By hearing and hearing. Well, they could have filled up the next 20 pages if they wanted to. But it's saying by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. Faith doesn't come by having heard. Faith comes by hearing. A lot of people don't have faith to appropriate to make their, uh, the promises of God their own because they don't even know what the Word says. And people will say, well, I don't believe that God heals today. Others will say, actually, I believe God's the one that put the sickness on people. How can anybody ever expect to receive from God when they think opposite of the way God thinks? In Hosea 4, 6, see, a lot of people never even heard. They've never even heard that Jesus himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses, according to Matthew 8, 17. And that is a quote from Isaiah 53. Now, you're not going to find it in Isaiah 53, not in the King James Bible. Because when he said he healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. If you have a reference Bible, it's going to take you back to Isaiah 53, 4, saying surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Griefs and sorrows are sickness and diseases and pains. It's just a difference in the translation. One's the Hebrew, one's the Greek. Peter, looking back at the cross, says, by whose stripes you were healed. Well, folks, if I were, he were healed, then I is. <laughs> now, I know that's not proper English, but y'all got the point, didn't you? Because if I were, then I am. Hallelujah. God's a good God. God said in Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Yeah, they don't even know it's God's will for them to be free, to be healed, to prosper. Folks, listen to me. I can remember the first message that I heard on financial prosperity. You know what happened to me? Did I jump up and shout and praise God? No, I didn't. My mind went tilt. Because all my life, growing up in poverty in South Georgia, around people that were religious and even some that loved the Lord, but still religious in that sense, you know what I mean? They were religious to their tradition. They did not know the Word. So everything I'd ever heard was, you know, God wants you to be poor. Somehow, being humble was equivalent to being poor in their, in their mind. If you're humble, you're poor, and you shouldn't want anything, and you shouldn't even ask for anything. But folks, when I heard that message that day, I told my wife, I said, I'm going to find out. Because my mind went tilt, and I was like, whoo. I like some of y'all the first time you heard that message. I don't know about all that. Maybe that preacher just wants my money. Well, first of all, I didn't have much to give to start with. <laughs> I don't know why people think that way. Most of the people have those thoughts. They don't have nothing to give anyway. <laughs> you want my $10 tithe. Come on, y'all. <laughs> but I tell you what, I went home and studied. And I studied, and I studied, and I studied. And listen, I took the Bible that I had. I took the book, book of Proverbs, for example. And everywhere in the book of Proverbs, when it talked about money, I put a P in front of it. If it talked about prosperity or poverty or money, I put a P in front of it. Then I went back, and everywhere it talked about, because see, when I started learning about confession, I'm talking about the process that God was taking me through. 
When I started learning about the power of confession, I went back through Proverbs again, and I put a C. Everywhere that it said mouth, tongue, or words, I wrote a C for con confession in front of it. And I studied, and I studied, and I studied, and I studied, and guess what I found out? I found out that my prosperity is directly connect connected to my obedience and to my confession. I discovered that confession brings possession. I discovered that God wanted me to prosper. In 1 Corinthians 2, 9, the Bible says that I has not seen nor ear heard, has, neither has it entered to the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Listen to this Amplified Classic. All that God has prepared, made and keeps ready for those who love him, properly obeying him and gratefully recognizing the benefits he has bestowed. David said in Psalm 68, 9, blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits. So I begin to recognize by studying the word, all of the benefits that God had bestowed upon me now that I am his son, they all are mine. They all belong to me. That's the reason Paul said in one place, all things are yours. Most people pass right over that. He said, all things are yours. What's he talking about? Everything that you would ever need in this life, God has already provided it through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has blessed us with all blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus God never intended for you to do without, to live in sickness, po poverty. That's not God's will. Just jot it down. Hebrews 6, 9 says there are things that accompany salvation. And one thing that accompanies salvation is the anointing. When I first started listening to men like Brother Hagin, Norval Hayes, when God first connected me with Brother Hagin, one of the scriptures that I heard constantly was Isaiah 10, 27. The last part of that verse says, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Let me show you all something. This is so powerful. The, the word anointing there comes from the Hebrew word shaman. It literally means fatness. Now watch this, the Amplified Classic of Isaiah 10, 27. The last part says the yoke will be destroyed because of fatness, which prevents it from going around your neck. Now, the verse before that, Isaiah 10, 26, God is talking about the Assyrian. The Assyrian was a king who had a vast army who was destroying nation after nation after nation, and he was bragging about what he was getting ready to do to Israel. And as the people of God cried out to the Lord, God said, I'm going to do the same thing to him that I did to the Midianites at the Rock of Oreb and what I did to the Egyptians at the Red Sea. Y'all remember what happened? Gideon was being oppressed. The Bible says he was, they were impoverished because of the Midianites, stealing everything they had. The Bible tells us that the children of Israel the night before they left Egypt, they stripped the Egyptians of everything they had. Psalms 105 tells us that they came out of Egypt with silver and with gold, and there was not one feeble person among their tribes. And so God says, listen, I did that to the Midianites, I did it to the Egyptians, and now I'm about to do it to the Assyrian. It is my anointing. It is my presence that's going to make all the difference in your life. And he said, you're going to experience such fatness, such richness, such anointing in your life that it's going to destroy every yoke of bondage. Whether it's sickness, disease, poverty, sin, addiction, no matter what it is, he says, it'll be destroyed. When I read this, I had a picture uh, in my mind of something that I saw one time. Someone undoubtedly had planted the tree and they had put, it was a little small tree, but a high, and they had put a rubber tire around the tree. Anybody ever seen this where I'm going? 
years later, years and years later, when I saw it, the tree now is bigger and it has literally split the tire. The tree is growing into the tire. The tire is not growing into the tree. The tree is growing. It is so rich and so fat and so big that now that yoke can no longer hold it. That's exactly what happened to you. If you get in the Word, get your mind renewed with God's Word, get your mouth filled with God's Word. God told Isaiah, he said, I have put my words in your mouth that I may plant the heavens. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth even as it is in heaven. That's exactly what God wants for you. No more bondage in your marriage, in your family life. No more bondage in your physical body. No more bondage in your mind of fear and doubt and worry, torment, depression. No more. No more bondage in your finances because God says, I'm about to bless you. I'm about to do something in your life that's going to destroy every one of those yokes. You know what a yoke is, folks. Now, you can let, keep the yoke of the devil or you can do what Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. Because if you take his yoke upon you, that means he's going to carry all the weight. All you got to do is walk with him. He'll be doing the pulling. He'll carry the weight. He'll do the destroying of everything in front of you that's trying to, to come against you. I love it when God said, I'll be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. And he said in the, in the New Testament, he said, I'm going to trouble those that trouble you. I believe that with all my heart. Amen? That's the reason I don't worry about a thing. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying to you? Well, folks, early on I discovered Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Now, wait a minute. Jesus was healing people, right? Now, these people that Jesus healed, according to the Bible, in Acts 10, 38, they were oppressed, which means to be under the dominion of the devil. So, if, that's, if they were healed by God's power, the anointing, and they were oppressed by the devil, how does anybody ever think that it's God who's making people sick today? Jesus said in Luke 4, 18, he's quoting Isaiah 61, verse 1, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? For he has anointed me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to open the eyes of the blind, to set the captives free. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying to you? So when I saw this, I said, you know what? Lord, I want this anointing. I want this the same anointing in my life. And as I studied, I began to find out there were other people throughout the ages since the time of Christ who have walked in the great anointings in their life. And they've seen such signs and wonders and miracles and manifestations and demonstrations of the Spirit of God. One of them was a man by the name of John G. Lake. John G. Lake was a Early 1900s was a millionaire, had a seat on Wall Street, and uh, God called him to the ministry. But now listen to this. When he was 21 years old, he became a Methodist minister. He married a lady by the name of Jenny Stevens. Less than five years after they got married, she was diagnosed with tuberculosis, and she had an incurable heart disease. It wasn't long before she became an invalid. Not only that, he had an invalid brother who had been bedridden for 22 years. He had a sister that was dying of breast cancer. She'd been operated on five times. He had another sister that was bleeding to death. Well, by then, he had heard about a man named John Alexander Dowie. Dowie had left Australia, had came to the United States, and set up his ministry in Chicago. Now, he checked into a hotel and the word spread, he was praying for people to be healed by the power of God. A very influential woman in the city who was dying came to the hotel. He and his wife laid hands on her and prayed. She was instantly healed. They put it on the front page of the Chicago Tribune. Word spread like wildfire. Well, by the time that John G. Lake heard of him, now he's got a very thriving ministry. 
he set up, you know, uh, these healing homes and stuff. So late turned to him. The only person he said that I knew of that believed in the power of God to heal. So first, they loaded up his brother on the train. They sent him to Chicago. Now we prayed for him, laid hands on him. Within moments, he was totally healed and got up and walked out. Then they sent the 34-year-old 30 year sister with cancer. She had been carried on a stretcher by the train. She was instantly healed, got up and walked off. Well, his mother called and said, if you want to see this other sister, the one that was bleeding to death, you better come quickly because she's dying. He said, when I got there, she was unconscious. He said, I couldn't even find a pulse. I sent a telegram to Dowie. It said, my sister has apparently died, but my spirit will not let her go. Folks, there's times when you've got to refuse to allow the devil to have his way. It is not God's will for a 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 60, 70 year old man or woman to die when God said, with long life will I show him my salvation. Amen. It's the days of the wicked that are cut short, not the days of the righteous. Right. Amen. Amen. And it has everything to do with what you believe in your heart and what you confess with your mouth and how your mind is thinking, how your mind is renewed. How's your mind wired? What's it been wired with? See, a lot of people, their mind has been wired with such doubt and unbelief that these things are the will of God. They don't know the truth. Well, Blake found out the truth. He said, I believe if you'll pray that God will heal her. Dowie said, send a message back. Hold on to God. I'm praying. She will live. And guess what? She did. Within the hour, God raised her up. She was healed. Well, that only left his wife, Judy, now. She lay there dying. Late realized that the other three, they had tapped into the power of God. He said, but how does healing really work? What made it happen? A minister friend had came by the house to see him. And after standing around Jenny's bed for a little while, they walked outside. His friend said, Brother Lake, listen, don't this just sound like, just like a bunch of religious folks that don't know the truth, that don't know the will of God? He said, Brother Lake, be reconciled, be reconciled to the will of God. What was he saying? He was saying, Brother Lake, this is the will of God. Let her go. Accept it. But he said to me, it was a slap in the face. He said, I grew angry as I thought on those words. In other words, let your wife die. He went back into the house. He took his Bible off the mantle. He threw it on the table. He said, when it hit the table, it fell open. Now listen to me. He said, I'm wondering, where is the power of God? Where is it when I need it the most? He said, the Bible fell open and I looked at it. Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all those that were oppressed of the devil. He said, I saw it. He said, sickness comes from the devil, not God. God heals. He said, God was with Jesus. God was with Paul. God was with Alexander Dow in Chicago. And he said, and God is with me. And he said, I realize that God's power is with me as much as with anybody else, that I could pray and the sick would recover. He said, I have the same Holy Ghost. I have the same faith. And I realize that if Jeannie's going to be healed, then it's up to me to do something about it. So many times people are crying out to God, wanting God to do something about it, but don't try to listen to me. How many of you remember when you got born again? Do you realize that the day that you got saved, all you did was appropriated by faith what God had already provided? We're saved by grace through faith. Faith takes what grace has provided. Your faith reached out and took the grace of God that brings salvation. Something that was provided over 2,000 years ago. Right. Amen? Amen? Well, see, now he's getting this revelation that healing belongs to us. So he said, 
I'm going to do something about it. This time, he set the time for Jenny's healing. He set the time. God didn't set the time. God didn't determine the time she would be healed. God didn't determine how she would be healed. John G. Lake did. He set the time for Jenny's healing. 9.30 a.m., April 28, 1898. Well, he notified certain people asking them to pray at the appointed time because at precisely 9.30, he was going to lay his hands on his wife and she will be healed. He said, it's that simple. Everybody says it's that simple. But what does people do? Today, people just walk the floor, beg God, and God's saying, you do something about it. It reminds me of Noel Hayes, the time that his, his daughter had all this gross on her body. She wouldn't wear shorts. She wouldn't wear short sleeve shirts. The gross were everywhere. They were gross. She was embarrassed. And he's crying out to God. And God said, why are you crying out to me? You do something about it. It's like the children of Israel. Y'all remember last week? The children of Israel, here they are. Now, I'm talking about the first service last week. I was talking about the children of Israel. Pharaoh was behind them. The Red Sea's in front of them. Mountains on both sides. They're trapped in. And they're crying out to God. And God said, why are you crying out to me? Take that rod that I gave you. Use the authority that I gave you. Hold it up over the sea and open it. Divide it. He had that authority. He had the authority to open it. He had the authority to close it when the Egyptians all drowned. So God said to Norval, he said, you do something about it. And he said, I got the revelation just like that. He said, I called my daughter in there, laid my hands on her. I cursed those gross. I commanded them to leave her body. I broke the power of the devil off of her. And I told him to go in Jesus' name. Well, it wasn't no time at all. It wasn't long at all. One day, all of a sudden, he hears her shouting because she suddenly realizes every growth is gone off of her body. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, Lake said, it's my turn to do something about it. Well, let me tell you something. He said, I went in at the appointed time. I laid my hands on her. And as soon as I laid my hands on her, he said, the paralysis left her body. The coughing stopped. Her heart became normal. Her temperature was normal. Her breathing became normal. And suddenly, now all of, before this, he said you could barely hear. All she could do was whisper, and you'd have to put your ear right down to her mouth to even hear what she was saying. That's how far gone she was. That's how weak she was. And he said, but when I laid my hands on her, all of a sudden, she shouted. So loud, people in the street heard her. I'm healed and jumped up out of the bed. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, I, I find it interesting that Jesus would ask certain questions to people. How long has it been that way? It makes me think, why did you allow it to stay so long? How come you hadn't already done something about it? Because whether y'all realize it or not, listen to me. Y'all remember that woman? Y'all remember the woman who had, uh, she was bent double, couldn't stand up straight, came into the synagogue. And when Jesus saw her, he called that woman to him. And he laid his hands upon her. And he said, woman, you are loose from your infirmity. The Bible says she had a demon of sickness. It was a demon actually attached to her. Well, she was instantly set free, instantly healed, stood up straight. But the religious people got mad about it. And he said, ought not this woman, now listen to the words, being a daughter of Abraham. That means she was a covenant woman. Israel had a covenant of healing. The covenant that God made with Israel was a covenant of healing. It was a covenant of prosperity. It was a covenant of blessing. And Jesus was saying, this woman has every right to be healed. This woman whom Satan is bound for these 18 years, ought not she to be healed because she is, after all, a daughter of Abraham. Well, let me tell you all something. If you're born again, you are a child of Almighty God. 
You've been washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have received eternal life. You have an inheritance as a child of God. And it's up to you. Now, you can be like Pharaoh, and you can sleep with the frogs one more night if you want to. When he told Moses, come back tomorrow. I've never been able to wrap my mind around that. Because the frogs are everywhere. They're in the cabinets. They're in the stove. They're everywhere. I mean, you can't get in your chariot without stepping on a frog. They're everywhere. And Moses said, all you got to do is say the word. He said, come back tomorrow. Now, let me ask you something. Is there anything in your life tormenting you? Anything that's tormenting your mind, your body, your family, your marriage, your children? How long has it been that way? How long are you going to allow it? To continue being that way. Or are you going to put your foot down and say, no more? I'm talking about drawing a spiritual line in the sand this morning. I'm talking about saying to the devil, Satan, I break your power off of my life. I didn't say my wife. I said my life. <laughs> See, everybody wants to break it off their wife. They don't want to break it off their own self. <laughs> I break your power off my life, off my family. Amen. I claim my son's salvation. I claim my daughter's salvation. I claim their healing, their deliverance in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I'm not putting up with this anymore. The Bible says resist the devil and he will flee. Listen to me. That's talking about from you. Because you have been given this authority. It has nothing to do with your age, your skin color, the language you speak, what kind of degrees you have or don't have, whether you are, listen to me, a professor or whether you have a sixth grade education. If you're born again, you have authority over the devil. And the devil doesn't want you to know it. I said he does not want you to have this knowledge. He doesn't want you to operate in this authority where you put a stop to all of his work. Amen? Everybody stand up with me, please. Just stand up real quickly. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Maybe you're one of those here today. You say, you know what? I made a decision. Today's my day. I'm not putting up with it anymore. I am going to step across that spiritual line in the sand. And I'm going to decree, this is my day. Today is the day of salvation. Today's the day of healing. Today's the day of deliverance. Today is the day of freedom. And I'm leaving this house free. No more tormenting. No more sickness. No more depression. No more family drama. I'm taking my place. If that's you, I encourage you to step up here right now. Because I want to lay my hands on you. I want to add my faith to yours. I want to release the anointing in your life. And I believe, and I'm going to pray a general prayer over every one of you, and I'm going to go down this line, lay hands on you. And when I do, I want you to begin to shout whatever's in your heart. I take it, devil, you are rebuked. I resist you. Today's my day. I take my healing. I take my deliverance. Whatever it is you need, I take my peace. I take back everything the devil stole from me. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying to you? Redeeming the time. For the days are evil, redeeming the time, making up for what's been lost. And if you will stand out here on this side, we're going to go. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Father God, I release my faith that as we lay our hands on these who have come, that the anointing would destroy every yoke, whatever yoke, whatever kind of yoke it is, that's bound them personally, spirit, soul, body, finances, their family, I believe, Father God, for their freedom that they will receive everything that they came for this day. And I decree that they will never be the same in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right now, receive in the name of Jesus. Receive in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Take it. It's yours. It's yours. Take it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. In the name, the name of Jesus. The name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The name is yours. Yours, take it in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Lord Jesus, in the name of the Lord Jesus. It's yours. Take it right now. It's yours in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. 
Hallelujah. Everybody say it's working. Say the Spirit of God. The anointing is working right now. And every person upon whom hands were laid, even if they don't see it, even if they don't feel it, it's working. We decree they will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. If you're not born again and you want to be, pray this prayer. Lord God, I believe with all my heart that Jesus died for my sins, that he raised from the dead. He is alive. I confess him, Jesus Christ, as my Lord and Savior. Lord, I want all you have for me. I will labor together with you. I yield to your grace working in my heart. I want to experience completed salvation to do what you want to do. I work with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah.